Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast. Today, I have my friend, Dr. David Pewter, with me, and he, I said, hey, we should do a show. I said, let's do one about Freud. And he said, okay, I'll send you something to read. And uh, we're going to talk about a paper from, uh, I think it's 1917, um, Morning and Melancholia by Dr. Sigmund Freud. Why'd you pick this one, man? I picked this one because it's an important paper. <laughs> there you go. And it's short. So it's like, it's, you know, 10 pages right. of reading. I thought, you know, if you haven't read any Freud, this is a good place to start to kind of see how he puts his thoughts together, how he creates his, how he creates his stuff. Yeah, I guess so. I should have introduced you. Uh, Dr. Pewter is a psychiatrist and he hosts and runs and is the star of the uh, Psychiatry and Psychotherapy podcast. You can go to, uh, subscribe to that thing on iTunes. Go listen to his show about uh, Ted Bundy. That's always cool. Man, I... So I read this. this these, these were the first words by Freud that I have ever read. I thought you were going to have us read something like Civilization and Discontents or you know one of these more sort of philosophical works. But I, this, this was fun. Um, let's describe this paper here. Do you want to or you want me to do it? Why don't you go for it? I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, so, yeah, it, this is his paper on mourning and melancholia. You know, we know what mourning is. And melancholia, I think most of us would call it depression. And, and he, says, he says that mourning and this depression share some characteristics. And they're both triggered by some sort of a loss. The, the mourning is triggered, in his opinion, by not only death of a loved one or maybe even loss of a cherished object like your liberty or... Uh, some preconceived notion, maybe. He, he, and then uh, reality testing, you know, like your father dies, and then by and by, reality lets you know that he's gone and that you didn't perish, and then you recover, and then the mourning process is over and you are restored to your previous state, mostly and onward and upward, right? But melancholia is different. Um, the thing that's lost is harder to, it's harder to figure out what that thing that is lost is. Um, the, uh, he believes, Freud believes that the depressed person is punishing a part of his or herself as a result of this loss. Uh, and that's part of this pro melancholic process. Um, and then he tries to describe, he tries to describe how, how the, pro how this melancholic process or state is resolved and, um, he speculates on what the causes of it and the mechanisms of melancholy are. That's about as good as I can do with the darn thing. Yeah. So let me put it, put it in the context for why it's an important article. Um, so in it, he talks about the object, the lost object, or there's this um, unconscious part of you, right. That creates the melancholia and melancholia. He defines as, you know, profound, painful dejection, cessation of interest in the outside world, loss of the capacity of love, inhibition of all activity, and a lowering of self-regarding feelings to the degree that finds um, utterance in self-reproaches and self-reviling, and culminates in the delusional expectation of punishment. And so he's really defining like modern day mm -hmm. depression. But within that, he talks about there's this unconscious sort of target. Like we know what that target is in mourning. We're, you know, we've, we know who died. We know sort of this loss of the ideal. But in melancholia, we don't always know what is that loss. Well, you know, and so he calls it this thing called like the object, right? And out of that came a whole sort of foundational component. Uh, way of looking at psychology and, and the mind and everything called object relations theory. And this is not some analytic thing that most people don't pay attention to. Actually, 
a lot of my mentors still believe in object relations theory. It guides so a lot you, of them. You mean mind. it's not some of this Freudian analysis, lay on the couch, talk to the man you can't see. A caric- it's not the caricature right. of Freud that we think of. When we think of Freud, we think of all the parts that haven't been already internalized into our, this is how the world works mentality. If that makes sense. Like there's a lot of Freud that we just like, it's just how we think as modern people, because it's so in the literature, it's so in. Yeah, he defined, um, he defined this field, right? I mean, the vocabulary that's used, the heuristics, the way things are thought about in your profession, I mean, he, he created all of that. He, he, he definitely, um, like if you look, if you look back through like Plato and Aristotle and, you know, a lot of the, like even like Darwin and a lot of these great people that came before him, um, a lot of the stuff he said was actually already out there. He just kind of like brought it all together. So similar to how Shakespeare brought together like a lot of history and art and put it in a new form. Um, and then that new form was the popular form of the day, right? And so he put it in this new form. Did he create all those stories? No, he pulled them from history and from literature and he kind of moved them around, right? In the same way you could say, this is what Freud did to psychology. And, and it's evident when you read like the interpretation of dreams, he's quoting all the greats, right? And so this is a great discussion for your, your readership because as you read uh, some of Freud, you'll see like pieces of the great literature pieces throughout his his work, right? So I wouldn't say he invented a ton of stuff, like even stuff like with dreams, how he says dreams are wish fulfillment. So when you have a dream, it shows you what you really want. So if you have a dream of um, having sex with some woman, that's not your wife, you know, and the day before you met this woman and maybe you were attracted to her, maybe that's like a wish fulfillment, right? And so but when you met her, you, you saw she was attractive. And then immediately you remember, you know, you have kids and this, and your mind is doing all this stuff, maybe without you even thinking about it. And so you kind of like immediately defended against like the thought that you might be interested in this woman, but in your dream, it comes out, right? So it comes out more clear that you have this attraction or desire. So, yeah, I think of when I think of Freud, I think of this is a person that brought all these ideas together and then was charismatic, slightly narcissistic <laughs> enough to, um, to believe that he had the right combination of ideas, right? And so he, anyone who didn't agree with him, he, the, the relationships ended badly. And so a lot of his really close pupils early on, eventually kind of went off and did their own thing because he wouldn't allow room for their creative ideas into his sort of way of thinking about things. It, he is clearly foundational. Here's how I know. I had never read a word of this, but so many of the ideas and so much of the vocabulary he uses in this paper, I already knew. Uh, you know, we all talk about ego and super ego and id and libido and, and, um, and this object narcissism, all, all, of, all of this language that he, he, he uses, uh, he popularized and kind of codified and made it make sense, I think, uh, for people. So, so the, back to this object idea. That, that's the key, isn't it? I, I think it is because, um, so let me explain like how we think about it now, because that will help you understand why this is, um, important idea to understand. So we have in our mind, um, in our like psyche, we have internalized aspects of our mother and our father because they spent so much time with us. Okay. Or if you had other primary caregivers, like if you have a nanny that spent four hours a day with you and, and imagine each one of these people is like an object. Okay. And then it object is not a great word for it, but it's just the word that's used. So they're going to be called an object. Now, In that object, in your psyche, you have emotions that point towards that object and there's emotions that point from the object to you. And sometimes those are very conflicted. So for example- Is that what he calls the cathexis? uh, No, I don't think so. Okay. But cathexis is one of those that I had to- 
object cathexis proved okay so here's a sentence the object cathexis proved to have little power of resistance and was brought to an end but the free libido was not displaced on the another object um i think i think it's a, the working through it's the working through of some of the conflicts that develop within the object so the cathexis is really like um to cathart to work through to like process right so if you're stuck with an object that is um that you have conflicting emotions towards right this can cause psychic turmoil okay and one example of this for freud actually i'll give you a definition of, of freud's object so freud had a mother uh who he made all good so all of his writings everywhere he glorifies his mother and then so you, you imagine the object of the mother and his emotion towards the mother that he's consciously aware of is all positive. But the thing is, is that there's some negative emotion there too. He's just not conscious of it. Okay. And then the, the emotion from the mother to him is all positive as well. And so, he, but there was some negative emotion, but he's not conscious of it. So how does that negative emotion get played out? Right. So one of the, the lines of thought is, some of his theories where he bases a lot of the issues that develop around the child. The child wants to have sex with the mother, but it's, it's libido. It's not just sex in, in the original, you know, in the terminology. So it's, it's a desire. It's a desire for attention. Okay. That's a lot, a lot of, but desire for the attention. So from that's the mother. A, so that's like popularly people are like, Oh, you know, he's got this Oedipus thing where they, and all children want to have sex with the mother. You're telling me right now, that that's really not what he's saying, that there's just like this libidinous desire for that sort of deep attention. It's not necessarily like intercourse. The word libido is desire, and it's it's desire beyond sex. It's a desire for attention. It's a desire for primacy in, the, in someone's mind. It's a desire for intimacy. So libido is not just, a, it's, it's, um, it's the sexual sort of drive is how they term it. But the way that we think of sex and the way that they, they thought of sex was very different. So it can be kind of, we can think of it exclusively in terms of sex and this, the act of sex. But you can look at, anytime you see kids, they're, they're always trying to vie for their parents' attention. We can all agree upon that. And we can all agree that um, sometimes they vie for the parents' attention and the exclusion of the other parent getting any attention from the spouse. So for example, we're on in the, in the bed, you know, wrestling around in the morning and my daughter wants to push me off the bed so she can have mommy all to herself, you know, something like that. Right. Or, um, you know, me and my wife are talking and the kids create like a fight to basically pull the attention from us communicating so that they once again can get the attention. So man, I don't want to get off too far off topic. So there's this object that Freud (laughs) had that was all positive. Okay. And what he doesn't have is the negative that is there. He's not conscious of it. And so it gets put up maybe in some of his theories where now his, the child is solely responsible for the inner tor- turmoil that develops later in life. How meta for you to use Freud to look at his theories? Well, it's, it's, something, it's, um, it's something that, fut- you know, people in the future like to do. So once you understand Freud, then you can read like the cloud of unknowing. I think right. it's the book if, if I remember it correctly, but it basically goes through a lot of the early psychoanalytic thoughts and it analyzes them from more of a uh, inner subjectivist point of view, which is like, okay, our own subjectivity determines which theories we are going to gravitate towards. So that, that brings me to, that brings me to, well, I want to go over some more of these terms. And I want to come back to that. The, the, no, what were you going to say? Well, so I, I, I'm reading this paper here, and the man's clearly brilliant, right? He's developed a heuristic, a way of thinking about melancholy and mourning that's very powerful and has some explanatory power. Um, and it's interesting, but he's also just bebopping and scatting here. He's thinking, he he says at the outset of the paper that he's had a, essentially that he's had a small sample size and we really can't draw any real conclusions, but here we go anyway. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. writes this thing, and I'm like, this is just this is social sciences right here. Have you seen that? Have you seen that uh, Twitter account, uh, 
new peer review, and they just po- they just post these no. absurd excerpts from social papers from the so- so social sciences, and they're just they're just rubbish. You know, they're just people talking about their experiences at the dog park and <laughs> how the dog park is like a you know a instrument of heteronormative you know oppression of you know it's it. I mean, this reads to some degree like that. This, the, this is this is one man opining on things that he's seen. Now he's brilliant. Um, he's come up with a very interesting, like I said, heuristic. He's come up with a very interesting way of thinking about about the mind, like the the ego and the superego and the id don't exist, right? It's a heuristic. It's a way of thinking about how people's brains operate, but you can't. We couldn't point to any of those things. The doctor's over here, like looking side to side. He's like, I don't know about that shit. Well, I, I think in general, I, I might disagree a little bit. I mean, there are parts of the brain that are more of the, like the superego or, you know, the judging, right? So the superego is, is, is the, um, the critic, the right. judge of your thoughts, right? And the ego. So ego in, analytic thought is a little bit different than like how we refer to ego pop in the popular sense, because in the popular sense, it's like, Oh, you need to kill your ego or you need, you know, the ego is bad or death to ego. Right. Whereas in the analytic sense, the ego is it's just, um, it's just the thing that of, mediates reality, right? It's, it's the part of us that's meeting reality that's driving forward. And if you don't have a lot of ego strength, then you're like, you know, not, going to be getting your needs met, not going to be moving forward in the world. And the id is kind of, the id is the base drives for self-preservation, for sex, for power, for climbing the dominance hierarchy. Like, and if you, so it's like the id is there and then you have the the super ego and they're both like, like, uh, you need sex. And the super ego is like, no, don't have sex. You'll get an STD. And then the, the ego is like, okay, how do I like, modulate these different sort of desires, right? The desire that I have. Except those three things don't exist. It's just a way of talking about how the inner, your inner dialogue works. Yeah. So I would say that maybe the ego is more of the, the limbic system and the, and then you have the, the base drives. It's more of the, the, you know, the brainstem, but of course we, you know, it's just a way of talking about it. You're, you're right. You're right. There's, there's 10 billion neurons, some with 30,000 connections. Anytime someone gives you a reductionistic view of the brain, just remind them, Oh, so there's 10 billion neurons, some with 30,000 connections, 30,000 connections. How, how do we even like decide that we can make simplistic models. And the, the reason is, is because our brain can hold about three things in its head at once. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm yeah. not, and I'm not, I'm not crapping on the idea. I mean, it's heuristic. It's powerful. You know, it, it has great, it has great power for simplifying, you know, when, when you're, when you're in, in, in therapy with a patient, you know, these tools, these ways of organizing your thought about what's happening, between you and the patient are super powerful. Um, but so he created a powerful heuristic, but he's just, I mean, th- th- this is just the product of his mind. Th- this isn't science but, in the strict part, the id, in the strictest sense is what I'm saying. Even the id, the ego and the super ego was used before him. So he didn't create that necessarily. He put more, he put different words to it. Um, but the, um, there was a guy, William, Gressinger, 1817 to 1868. And he, um, he came up with the, you know, wrote the I or ego is the role of repression of mental illness. So, you know, there were people before him that kind of had written about this. Um, and so, so he's really kind of taking it to the next level by, through his heuristics. Yeah. (laughs) I like that word. I, I, I think that's what it is. Again, it's powerful, but this isn't science in the strictest sense. These are the musings of a professional person who has a great deal of experience. Full stop. Well, I, th- I think I think I would di- I differ from that in a little bit because I would say that we can gain science from qualitative and quantitative studies, and I think the, there's a movement in science moving more towards this um, qualitative study, which is like you hear people's story, 
and you write down the details of their story. So maybe you have 10 cases of depression and you've written down in detail all of what's happened, right? And then you look back for similarities because it's hard from just the quantitative to get to a lot of what's going on. Right. So I think that you could, you could argue that one of the problems that happened was that they took, they took theory and then they looked through the theory in order to see what was going on. And so his ideas informed what he would actually see. And because he was highly intelligent, he was able to bend everything he saw into the different ideas that he had, you know, and I think that's where smart people get into trouble is when they have um, overvalued ideas that they, that they use their intellect to defend. Whereas they they may not be seeing reality as right. it is. Yeah. Freud is a hammer and all he sees is nails. Yeah. So, so he says that in mourning, the object is clear. So we've talked about the object, the morning in mourning, the object is clear. Your father has died. You are sad. The object was clearly father. He's gone. And then reality lets you ch- see every day that dad's not there, and yet you persist and you're okay. The phone still ain't ringing and it still ain't him. And th- so reality shows you that that yourself isn't isn't truly isn't irreparably damaged, and then you recover. But in melancholia, the object isn't clear. And so the, the path out of that isn't clear either. So, something's wrong. We don't know what it is. We don't really know how to fix it. And he, he makes some, mm-hmm. he speculates at what some of these objects might be. He talks about uh, fear of poverty was one of the things that can cause people to be in this depressed state, which I thought was interesting. Disappointment, disappointment in a loved one or someone close to the 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 melancholic could could potentially be the object um what were some of those other ones uh, what are what are some other ones that you you see in your world so even in the first paragraph he says and some of these forms suggest somatic rather than psychogenic affections so he's kind of hinting that there could be um medical issues that lead to more of a melancholia somatic mean more medical of the body so yeah so uh we would call that clinical depression right people with uh for example pancreatic cancer can get depressed um people with uh parkinson's disease can one of the first symptoms that some people with parkinson's disease get is depression and so they have the depression for a year preceding the the tremors or the this the slowing down of their muscle um and mechanics People who have, you know, hypothyroidism can be depressed. People with uh, low testosterone can seem depressed. We talked about that. Um, so there's different medical reasons for depression. And um, so it kind of highlights that as well. So, so what are some medications that, that, that you would prescribe for, for depression or that doctors prescribe for depression? So it really depends on how severe the depression is, right? So if it's a mild or moderate depression and you have a person that has enough motivation that they want to do the psychotherapy, they want to do um, lifestyle changes, strength mm-hmm. training, you know, changing their environment. So in those cases, I might just do psychotherapy. But if they have a more severe depression, that's when some of the antidepressants actually work considerably better than placebo. And... Um, so we, we might do something like an SSRI, you know, Prozac, Zoloft, and, or an SNRI. So that's a, it not only has a serotonin reuptake, but also the norepinephrine reuptake. So that could be something like a duloxetine or venlafaxine. So we, we've got a whole panoply of, of, of medicine, of chemicals that you, we can give people if, they're, if they have this melancholia, if they're depressed. Okay. And you also gave an example of someone that had Parkinson's or... Uh, pancreatic cancer, having being depressed uh, or, or uh, experiencing depression, absent something like that, do you think that the, the psychotherapy can fix it for most people? If you look at like head to head studies, psychotherapy and medications tend to be pretty similar in the mild to moderate range in efficacy. Um, 
Now, it's also taking into account like what the person wants, right? Because some people will not go into psychotherapy. Like I have a lot of men who come to me and, you know, I talk to them about psychotherapy and they're very resistant towards it. So I'm like, well, I got to get this person out of depression right. somehow. And although I talk a lot about strength training with, with people, it's a rarity that I'll get someone who will actually um, do the necessary steps to learn how to squat, right. deadlift, you know, bench and press and stuff. So sometimes, especially if they have no motivation, right? So one of the one of the symptoms of, of depression is they just lack motivation to do anything. Usually they have enough motivation to just put a pill in their mouth. So sometimes you'll start with that and then you'll move on towards the other things once to get a little bit better. So there, there are clearly people that maybe have Parkinson's or this pancreatic cancer like you described that have depression that may be very hard to blunt. But then there are other people that would have just this object loss style Freudian melancholia, you know, would, would, uh, so giving them a pill, I mean, if what he says in this paper is true, giving them a pill is sweeping this stuff under the, under the rug and would, I mean, and is, so is psychotherapy the thing in your opinion? Is that the thing for those people or is it, is it, is it cool to give them some Prozac, some SSRIs? So, I mean, I think we've come a little bit ways in how we see depression from what he talks about here. Um, depression also has like, there's like inflammation in the brain practically, you know? So My brain like, is inflamed constantly. There's a reduction of something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is like miracle growth for the brain. The, the other thing that Freud really missed that was developed in subsequent years, if you look at the development of psychoanalytic theories, the so people who go to a psychoanalytic institute. So I went to a psychoanalytic institute for two years after I graduated from residency. So I was already a psychiatrist. So I went to a psychoanalytic institute. And um, a lot of what they talk about is like, okay, here's where Freud was, but here's where we've come. And so there's a whole evolution of thought that's really based in part on science and what science has shown and the progression of things. So one of the big things that's, that, that Freud was off on was attachment theory. And so um, in the early parts of the century, there were a lot of really amazing researchers in attachment theory and how they just watched children develop and they watched children very closely for years and they created a lot of theory based on that. And so that has subsequently changed how we view how people develop. So that all being said, there's two types of depression that I broadly see. Okay. One is you're an adult, you didn't have depression in your adolescence, and now you've gotten depressed, okay? If you rule out the medical issues, so this person doesn't have any medical issues causing the depression, then the next thing is, is the depression due to stressors in life, right? Like acute stressors, or is there something else more confusing? And if there's something else more confusing, then I would say, yeah, maybe that's maybe a, a more reflective type of psychotherapy can get underneath what's really going on. Like Freud is talking about the objects relations theory in the second type. So that was the first type. The second type is like, okay, starting in adolescence, this person had passive suicidal thoughts starting 12, 13, 14. So sometimes we consider this more like borderline personality disorder. I don't like that term, but it's like this person probably had some complex trauma growing up. They either had, pretty significant neglect or abuse or um, just differing personality types from your parents. Maybe one of your parents took on the sick role a lot and you were kind of the adult growing up. Um, that, can, that can lead to that as well. But, it's, but this person will suffer from a lot of dissociative type of things, attachment things. So the type of treatment that this person might need may be more psychotherapy. And that's what we found. So the first type that I described could be considered more of like the melancholic mm -hmm. depression. And when this gets really severe, this person is waking up early in the morning with intense anxiety sometimes, and they have lot, they, everything in their life is colored with this lens that is just dark. So everything is dark. This person may need medications and they may need it to get out of that state in order to do some of the psychotherapy. So I'm really like, both are important and both should be considered. I want to get someone out of the depression as quickly as I can. Okay. And I, I don't want them to go back into depression. So you give them the drug 
to kick them over the fence so that you could maybe do the psychotherapy at that point, maybe. Sometimes. I mean, there was one patient in particular when I was starting, I was gung-ho psychotherapy and um, I would meet with them once a week and it was so painful. I mean, this guy was so depressed. And finally I was like, you know, I think we need to try something different. It was about one year in, yeah. you know, and like Gosh. the guy was still super down, super depressed. And um, so we, we did both, you know, we put him on some meds. He's been on meds for years. And, but if you look at this guy's family, everyone suffered from really severe depression. Like this guy's dad is living somewhere in the middle of nowhere in a trailer and doesn't interact with any human beings. And when this guy visited him, he just sat there and didn't say anything. You know, so some severe family depression. Was that one of my cousins? Right. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Should I stop talking about you? <laughs> it's interesting you said, you know, about this man from earlier, early in your practice. I'm no psychiatrist, but I barbell train people. You know, we've got these people that we, come, we encounter early in our careers and we just don't do the best job for them, you know? Uh, or we, you know, we don't, we don't manage uh, our relationship with them and the work that we give them or whatever early on the way we would now that we got more experience. It's, it hurts, man, looking back at some of the people that, you know, I could have done better for, you know, if only I'd known more, but you can only do what you can do, you know, it sucks. Yeah. One of my favorite things about this paper, it's on page seven of the one you and I have, he, he talks about this ambivalence that the, that the melancholic person has. Um, he says that if the love for the object, a love which cannot be given up through the object itself, uh, though the object itself is given up, takes refuge in narcissistic identification, then the hate comes into operation on this substitutive object, abusing it, debasing it. Now, it's narcissistic identification. So the object now is the self. That's what he's saying, Right that the object itself is given up and it takes refu refuge in narcissistic identification, then the hate comes into operation on the substitutive object, abusing it, debasing it, making it suffer, and deriving sadistic satisfaction from its suffering. The self-tormenting and melancholia, which is without doubt enjoyable, signifies, just like the corresponding phenomenon in obsessional neuroses, a satisfaction of trends of sadism and hate which relate to an object which have been turned around upon the subject's own self and the ways we've been discussing. There, oh, man, and, it's heavy. And he it, it, and it goes on to say, goes on to say essentially that it's an attempt to take revenge on the original object of love. So th this is where, like for some people, I say, man, before you date again, <laughs> you really need to do some right? psychotherapy. And you'll be, you'll be a different person in that next relationship. Um, or I had this one patient who, um, you know, got out of this destructive relationship and she did a lot of therapy and she was fearful going back into relationships again. I'm like, you're going to be a different person this time around. Um, so basically like if you have this rage towards the object, you take it out, not only on yourself, but when you are in a relationship with someone else, they become part of yourself to the degree that you will take the rage out on them. Yeah. So that's what this paragraph is describing. So like, let's say you're, you're, you have this rage towards your mother because she was absent because she, you know, was addicted to meth or something. And you just can't like work out the conflicts that you have towards. Let's not talk about mother. my cousins again. Then, Come on. And then, and then you date someone else and you have, you know, at first it goes perfect, right? You love this person. There, you know, there's so many good things, but then eventually, like your true, so your true, sort of conflicts start getting played out as the attachment grows, and you get angry or malevolent, right? So they're describing like, like some sadistic qualities to how you you want to hurt this person, right? And there, it's really like your object that there's the conflict on. And now you're trying to sort of, you, now it's just like your unconscious is getting worked out in real life, which is not healthy to anyone. Yeah, because yeah, he goes on to say um, that the object on this, well, which this illness is centered, is usually found in the immediate environment. 
So, you know, it, it, it could be, People. you know, like in the example of this woman you're talking about, it could be her boyfriend. She's still in a relationship with him. There's something about him that she wants <laughs> revenge on. And so she damages herself. She punishes herself constantly. And since he's in a relationship with her, I mean, that affects his relationship, right? She's now melancholic. She's disengaged. She's all of these things that he descri- that Freud describes. And now he has to pay the price for that. So it serves to punish the person that she's in the relationship with because she's no longer available, on and on and on. Am I wrong? No, no, you're, you're seeing it. You're seeing it. And so it can be really hard to be in a relationship with someone who's yeah. depressed because one of the early symptoms of depression is irritability and um, uh, just this anger, this hostility. Oh my gosh. Oh, I, and sometimes, you know, it comes out in road rage and sometimes it comes out towards right. your spouse or towards your loved one or towards your kids. And it's like, you don't want that. You don't want that to happen. And so sometimes I'll see these, these people who are like, I don't know why I'm just such an asshole, you know, at times. And so it can be helpful to look at this with another lens. If anything you can do to not take away personal accountability, but to reduce shame will be important. Oh, the shame thing. Early in the paper, he says, he says that people often, they, they often start doing a, a, a self-evaluation and they start to see all of their faults. Uh, help, heightened self-criticism, where someone may describe themselves as petty, egoistic, dishonest, lacking in independence, whose sole aim has been to hide the weaknesses of his own nature. It may be so far as we know, he has come pretty near to understanding himself. <laughs> uh, and we only wonder why a man has to be ill before he can be accessible to the truth of this kind. For there could be no doubt that if anyone holds and expresses to others an opinion of himself such as this, an opinion which Hamlet held both of himself and of everyone else. He is ill, uh, whether he's speaking the truth or where is he, whether he's being more unfair to himself. And he's speaking. <laughs> so, so it's interesting because he says in one of these, I don't know if it was this thing and quoted if he did, but he said, but of course there are some people who really yeah, are he's talking worthless. about a woman that was, had a poor opinion of herself. And he's like, she, she may really be worthless. <laughs> which is like, um, of course, it, it puts this in into the time that it was written, right? Um, okay, let's talk about that. But what, but what he was talking about in that what you wrote, what you read, was people can, when they're depressed, have a very poor opinion of themselves that is not founded in reality. I just met a, a man just this last week, and he wasn't a patient of mine. We were just having a conversation, and the guy was incredibly brilliant. He was incredibly driven. And he did actually really good work connecting with other people. But when he talked about how his image of himself, it was so poor. And I think he really believed it. Because some people, of course, just say those kind of things to, it's you know. ego impoverishment, Freud would say, yes. Yeah. Ego impoverishment. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the, that's one of the symptoms that are one of the one of the symptoms that he describes in melancholia. I experienced a little of this earlier this year. Dr. Peter, I sold my business in December, and which I had been working on for a couple of decades. And it was a good thing to do that, but it certainly marked a change in, in my life. You know, that's going to, for, forever it will be before the sale and after the sale, you know, when we talk about things probably for me. And man, I found myself for just a couple of weeks uh, in March, two or three weeks in March, I didn't want to do anything. And I, and I mean that I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to do, I didn't even want to lay in bed. I didn't want to do anything. Um, there's just nothing more I can say about that state. I mean, that just encompasses it all. Okay. So you had decreased interest, poor focus, poor poor focus. I was, I was highly focused on not doing anything. Low energy for sure. Just deep fatigue. Just felt like I had the flu. Issues with sleeping? Uh, probably, yeah. Falling asleep, yeah. staying asleep. Did you have any thoughts like, oh man, I wish I was dead. I wish no. I wasn't alive. No, get none that? of that. And uh, did you have guilt? Uh, well, just 
persecutory guilt, like I'm a bad person or just my white Anglo-Saxon Protestant stuff. Like I should be working <laughs> guilt about that, but that's about it. But you always right. feel that way, right? So that's more of your right. super ego there. And, and then, <laughs> uh, and then I got vertigo. I was doing the bench press, which was miserable to do, by the way. I said to like almost hold myself at gunpoint to make myself train. And I was doing the bench press, I had five sets of five, and I set up off of the bench from the last set of five, and the world just spun. Just hmm. like as bad, as bad as it could possibly be, I think. And that persisted for a day and a half or so, and it was like a Saturday afternoon. And so Monday, I went to the physician. He's like, oh, psh, pressure on your ear is just ridiculous. And uh, you know, I had fluid on my inner ear and you know, got some help from that. And then I was better. Hmm. What did he give you? Oh, he gave me some steroids and an antibiotic. Steroids, oral steroids, he gave or me a shot. local steroids. He gave you a shot. In where did he in give my you hip, the shot? And he also gave me some uh, some Flonase, you know, and uh, huh. to open up that eustachian tube, I guess, and then the antibiotic. And um, I think that the big life change had me disoriented to some degree, and then. Uh, I had this, I had this low grade sort of inner ear thing that was just boiling my frog. You know, I just, I just didn't feel well. And, and it was just, just a confluence of, you know, a dozen things it just had me way down. It was really interesting. But within a day after the mm-hmm. clearing up that vertigo stuff, I was much, much better in every regard. Did you have the low self thoughts that were different from your baseline. No, I wasn't. I didn't. Mm. Critical self thoughts. Cause it's almost, it almost sounds more like a morning than a melancholia. Cause in morning he talks about, you know, the loss, you know what you've lost. Right. Right. You lost this business or you've, you've graduated the business, I would say. Yeah. No, you're probably right. Yeah. It was, it was, it probably wasn't a, a classic depression. Probably was a morning, but, uh, I was uh, sad as hell for about three weeks. And I'm not like that. Yeah. What do you think it was about shifting your business that was like the part that was the biggest I, loss? I actually don't know if that, I'm actually not sure that it's getting rid of the business that's the loss. Getting rid of that has removed a distraction Right. I could go, I could go and take refuge maybe in that work. Right. And, um, uh, I've been more keenly aware of the state of the world <laughs> since, since getting rid of that. And it doesn't please me. I think that's a lot of it. Some frustration there. Oh yes. Oh yes. This isn't supposed to tell me about that frustration. <laughs> um, well, the, the the world isn't the same place that it was when, um, when I was a younger person, and in a, in in many ways, it's not better. Um, we've been I've been told, and I think we've all been told that there's that um, you know that there's this positivist. That we live in this positivist world that things get better, you know, better living through science, everything gets better, you know. Um, but that doesn't seem to be true. And in fact, a lot of things seem to be worse. You know, you know, I've talked about community and how people have fewer, fewer friends and fewer time or less time with friends and, um, people are lonelier. Um, I mean, I could, I could just go on and on and on about all the, the changes that have taken place in the since, since I've been able to observe them. And, um, I think the condition of the, of people in the West, even though maybe, uh, even though maybe they have plenty of calories and air conditioning and access to antibiotics in many ways is poorer than it was in 1985, maybe, or 75. And uh, that causes me a great deal of upset sometimes. You know, I would challenge you though, and this is not me being a psychiatrist, this is me being a friend. Because um, I think your online great books project, right? Bringing people, men together, putting them in community, like bringing them back to the basics, you know, things you're passionate about, right? Um, getting them to read again, something that is a dying capacity, right? So that is, in a sense, your work. Sure. 
towards to overcome this frustration, right? And um, and I would say that's the that's what's in your power to do, and that's the change that you can make. And you're not going to make it in, you know, a hundred thousand people's lives, but you know, through touching maybe a thousand or 10,000 over the course of your life in this career, you may um, eventually touch those that they could touch as well. Right. Right. So it's like, there's a multiplier effect there, which I think is, is something to keep your focus on, you know, your frustration, your energy is, and how like, yeah, we're not going to be able to solve the issues or change the, the way that things are going, you know? Um, but we can make a small improvement in the, in the, in the part that we can actually sure. control. And to that point, I see a lot of people get frustrated about these things in a similar way to you, but they don't have any plan on how to actually make the world a better place. Like they don't have like a plan on how they can use their energy productively. Right. Yeah. And that can lead to worse issues. Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing some good. I, I got an email from a guy. I want to read it. Um, I'm not going to say who it was. He says, hey, Scott, I know this might be a little unusual, but I wanted to send you a quick note of thanks for answering the call to pursue this mission. I don't like that kind of language, but we'll take it. I'm only about eight months into the program, but I honestly can say that it's changed my life. My internal dialogue, worldview, and perspective on life are vastly different than when I started. I like to think I'm growing, becoming wiser, and have it become a better father, husband, and man. Quick question. I'm updating our estate plan and would like to list OGB among the places where some of our estate may go when the time comes. Blah, blah, blah. Well, he doesn't need to do that. But but it just but it just shows that it has made a difference for this person in a substantive way, and he would, you know... And, uh, and, he, and he wants to show us thanks for that. So that's that's very, very kind and very surprising uh, to have someone offer such a thing. Well, here's, here's, here's how that person is doing exactly what we're talking about, right? They see the value for themselves. And so their question is, okay, how can I help you do this more and help right. more people? You know? And so, you know, that is that's what I would consider someone moving into a point of generativity, you know? So there's an older man I'm imagining. So he, um, you know, he wants to give back. He wants to make the world a better place. He has his own frustrations for how things are. He wishes probably he found this program bef before. Right. And, um, and he's just now sort of coming to it. And so, you know, it's like that question of like, okay, how can I help the things that are positive improve. And this is, uh, this is, I think as men and women where we need to put our, our thoughts. So for me, it's the podcast, you know, for my, my own psychiatry and psychotherapy podcast and, and YouTube channel and the, the social medias that support that. And it's because I think if I can train um, 10,000 mental health professionals to be better at what they do. Okay. To be more empathic, to be more wise, to understand the, the, the good science, better, right? Then those people are going to go out and help another 10,000 people over the course of their life. And that's 10,000 times 10,000. That's a hundred million people. That's the multiplier effect in my mind. And that makes me happy. That gives me incredible meaning. You couldn't, you couldn't pay me um, to, to not do that, you know? So in my mind, it's like the meaning that I get from that, it's, it's outside of money. So this guy's wants to give you money to help your mission, I would start thinking like, okay, if I had, if I had money coming from sources like this, of people who wanted to support it to just grow it faster, you know, how would I do that? Would I, would I create, what kind of content would I create? What kind of ads would I place? You know, I don't, I don't know the answer for you because you're looking for a, a certain type of person that's, that's very driven um, or driven enough to want to start this journey. Right, so this is not the average person fed up enough, and to see it as valuable, so it's it, it, they kind of have to build a relationship with you yeah. for a while before they're going to enter into that. You know, so like I don't know if Facebook advertising <laughs> would help you at all because it's not. <laughs> it, yeah. it it could potentially, honestly, it could. Most of most of what we do is you know podcast stuff and podcast appearances. We, we get, when we can make a long form argument for why reading these things is helpful. 
it seems to make a difference. The long form argument, it's hard to make the to make the argument in just a slogan and uh, and have people actually you know, commit to doing such a thing as reading this. Man, I, I had to look up back to this text. I had to look up one, two, three. Well, I'll tell you, I looked up ego and I looked up id in my Oxford English Dictionary, although I had a pretty good idea what those things meant. Cathexis. Also, it went and looked at the German because I got a I got a little German. In Cathexis, he calls it uh, besetzen, which is like to occupy an occupation. Mm-hmm. Um, like a, okay. we, we, we would probably say preoccupation. It's the thing that occupies or holds attention. But uh, melancholia, I looked that up. Uh, and I looked at plaints. Plaints. I had never heard that one. So uh, we, we talk about complaints, complaints all the time. But plaints are just like these mournful noises that you make in protest or, uh, you know, a complaint would be something specific. You know, I hate... Arby's because they never get my order right. But if you just bitched, if you just moaned about it in the parking lot, that would be plaints. <laughs> and we've heard about you know people being plaintive, or a poem is a plaintive mm-hmm. poem or whatever. So I had to look up several words. This is just eleven pages, and I've got a pretty decent vocabulary. I had to look up five or five or six words. Uh, but man, I mean, to get to read this and see and, and read how this man's mind works, how he, ob- how he observed people, how he was such a keen observer and then drew conclusions from those things, which he observed and then wrote this and wrote it in such a careful way that I could be, I could be, you know, I could be party to those observations. I mean, excellent. I mean, we're reading a translation here, so we're not, get- I, I looked at a little of the German, which I'm not very good at. Um, but I mean, what, what a lesson. I mean, the guy is a genius. Crazy as fuck, the guy, genius. The guy, the guy was probably two to three standard deviations above the mean IQ wise. Yes. I mean, it's obvious from his work. Probably, probably one forty five, if not higher. Yeah, and, yeah, and just driven. It's a, it, it was it was wonderful to read it. We need to read. I need. I look forward to reading some more Freud. Yeah, the, this idea of the object. I mean, I. I I, I grasped onto that that right away. Um, is is I think is important. I mean, even as somebody who does is not, I am not a mental health professional. I know from having children and being in relationships that that uh, that we all hold on to these various objects to our detriment or to our or to our credit, and we move mm-hmm. from object to object through our lives. And sometimes it's sometimes that ain't easy. <sighs> One of the things I would add that is kind of the current understanding of this, um, which I think, you know, cause he's thinking you shifted object. So you kind of like grieve the object and then you move on to another object. And I would say that that the, the relationships that we have get internalized into us and never leave us. Um, and they become a part of us. And so for example, in psychotherapy, I may have a patient for a couple of years and then we may end the relationship. Some of the terms, some of the words that I may talk about with that patient towards the end of our treatment is that as we are graduating you, um, there's a part, there's a part of you that's been internalized in me. And, and likewise, there's a part of me that's been internalized in you. And so, you know, you may, when you have conversations with yourself, think, you know, Oh, Dr. Peter would have said this. And so there's this kind of like internalization that takes place and if you have a very positive experience with someone, that internalized object of them becomes a very life-giving, confidence-boosting, ego-boosting, positive thing for the rest of your life. And so he kind of sees it as like you're one and then shifts out another one. I would say now that we kind of have furthered the object relations theory um, with, with Winnicott and Fairbairn and some of the people that came after him, there's this sort of idea that this object goes with you in a positive way. And this is actually part of or negative. how good psychotherapy works and good mentorship or, works. Or negative right? way. Or a negative way. Yeah. And sometimes there's the conflicts that need to be worked out. And that um and that's part of the journey as well. Man, this has been this has been a delight. Thank you for uh, putting this in front of my face. Uh, I wouldn't have read this one had you not had you not suggested it. 
That was a delight. I read it three times. You know, hold, it just holds up. Wow. Uh, you know, I'm I'm really impressed on how much you understood this thing. How dare you? <laughs> no, I'm impressed. <laughs> okay. So, what did you think was going to happen? I don't know. I thought I thought you you were going to be more confused by it or something. But I think you really like to no, voice some stuff. Definitely. And so, you know, I used my uh, Mortimer Adler's method for reading this. I read through it very, very quickly the first time and identified a bunch of terms that I did not understand. Uh, his ter- his okay. idea of a – well, okay, we'll talk about uh, – I don't think we talked about this. His idea of a – of an in, of an economy, a Freudian economy, uh, the cathexis, we've already talked about that, the object. So he talks about an economy in – I I couldn't figure out what the hell that meant. But well, to go on, though, I read through it the first time. I found a bunch of terms I didn't understand. I went to my Oxford English Dictionary. I looked those up. I read it a second time. Now that I understood them, I started to put some things together. Uh, and then I read it a third time to just come up with a few questions to ask you and a direction for the podcast. But uh, in the first reading, I can't tell you that I got very much from it. I identified a bunch of holes yeah. that needed to be filled in terms of vocabulary and terms and his arguments. And then the second one, I had the words, and then I was able to identify what his arguments were, and then I then I kind of had the paper, and then we could then I read a third one just to make sure I wasn't stepping in and getting gopher holes or whatever, and could do you know talk about it. Um, but this economy idea, I looked around on the internets, and I, of course, I tried to take it from context, and I'm not exactly sure what he was talking about. Um, but I, I, so here's what I think, though, I find that people will have some sort of a behavior. It can be some sort of a dysfunctional thing. It can be good. It can be bad, whatever. But they're getting a payoff, right? There's a reward. Sometimes it's dysfunctional, but they're getting some sort of a reward from these things. And in, 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 so that reward is the payment for the behavior. That's, so is that what he's talking about in terms of an economy? No, no, I don't, I don't think so. You, there's different qualities of mental energy and you kind of want to find a balance of it. And this is kind of the economic model. So you're balancing the, the mental energies, you know, maybe um, libido would be considered one of them, sexual instincts. And then you have the, the id, the ego and the super ego, you know? And so you're trying to balance that. I think that's I think that's more what he's okay. talking about. That, that jives with what I read there. He he uses this language of sort of like electromechanical stuff where things have charges and things flow, and you have these energies and these cathexes. Like he's got a, got a this language of the I mean, full blown German, right? Got this language of like elect, the electromechanical that he that he he had to invent in some ways a vocabulary to talk about these concepts that he's talking about, well, and that's where he kind of go. Yeah. I, I, I think part of that's coming from um, his prior work. So in the first, in the first um, phase of his life, he really studied the nervous mm-hmm. system, and he was um, he was mentored by a histologist. And so, so his first paper was actually a histology paper where they were looking at like you know the material. And so a lot of his thoughts early on was that everything comes from things that are um, material. And things that are um, can be known. So that he's he's kind of a materialist. He's kind of a determinist yeah. as well. Determinist. So every cause has an effect, and every psychological thing that's going on has a cause, right? Um, determinist. And so, you know, he wrote articles on the acoustic nerve, and books on cerebral paralysis and aphasia. And so some of his sort of words are in that kind of line of thinking. So if you understand that, that's where he's coming from. So predeterminist or determinist. So uh, you need who's a psychic you need to determinist. Get, uh, you need to come to Tulsa on the third Thursday because you know, we're going to be uh, reading Erasmus and Luther's correspondence where they're arguing free will. And Marbo Group is going to nice. be talking about that on the third Thursday. Ah, there may be fist fights. Well, thank you for doing this. This was a blast, man. Pick another one. Let's do it again and again and again. I love it. This is fun. Yeah, and we could do. Uh, we could do a little Marcus Aurelius. I don't know if you have you read his uh, oh yeah the meditations. That's one of my favorite texts. Yeah. We could do that. I'm in. Okay. Hey, if you guys have any questions on this, I'm going to be posting a post in my social media on this. I would love um, 
to sort of dialogue. So if you actually read, if you actually read this, if you have any questions, shoot, put it in a comment on my social media or on the YouTube. Tell them, uh, tell them what your Instagram is. My Instagram is just dr at David Pewter. And, and the podcast is the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy podcast. If you just look up an iTunes Psychiatry, it's one of the first ones that'll come up. It'll have my name on it, Dr. David Pewter. It'll have this really cool light bulb brain <laughs> gears That's right. in it. Uh, we were, we, uh, so we read Morning and Melancholia by Sigmund Freud. I think it's 1917. Uh, you can find that thing at archive.org or all over the internet, Gutenberg, uh, Project Gutenberg, whatever. Go get that. It's a, it's like 11 pages, and uh, it, ain't, it ain't an easy read, but it's, uh, it's rewarding, and uh, you get to see the foundations of, of uh, psycho, psychoanalysis there in that paper. So, Delight, thanks so much for doing this, David. Well, Hey, we'll do uh, we'll do some uh, Stoics here soon. Thanks. All right, man. sounds good. Okay. All right, take care.